Hey there, and welcome back to the National Solar Observatory. We're glad that you're able to join us again, and we hope that you're finding our web series helpful in the run up to the solar eclipse. We're less than six months out from the solar eclipse now, uh, coming on August 21st of 2017. So hopefully you have all of your travel plans made, you have your hotel rooms booked and know where you're going to be for the solar eclipse. And if not, it's definitely time to get on it. Today, we're going to be talking about observations how you can observe the eclipse, what scientists do with eclipse observations, and we have a very special guest, Dr. Shadia Habal, joining us all the way from Hawaii today. Shadia is one of the world's leading experts in solar eclipse observations, and so she's going to share with us some of her experiences. To start off today, we're going to discuss a very important eclipse observation that happened more than 150 years ago. Back in 1859, an important instrument called a spectroscope was invented by two scientists named Bunsen and Kirchhoff. And this really revolutionized how people could see and observe and understand the nature of light. So a spectrograph is very similar in how it works to a prism. You shine light through it and the spectrograph or the prism breaks up the light into its different components. Now, when we shine visible light through a prism, it breaks up the visible, the white light that we shine through into all of the different colors of the rainbow. And so we're able to observe red and green and blue and purple and all of the different elements. But that can be done outside of the visible wavelength as well. Scientists use spectrographs because they can be used to pull out some really fine detail in the spectrum that is being analyzed. When we look at the spectrum of light, we generally see this as a series of peaks and troughs lots and lots of squiggly lines. And each one of those lines is a signature of a specific type of atom or molecule or ion. So that is like a fingerprint of a particular element. And that means that we know that that element is present in the material that's emitting the light. So if we look at the spectrum coming from the sun, we can study the fingerprints coming from the sun and we can tell which components, which elements are in there. And not only that, but we can tell how much of those elements are in there as well. A defining moment in solar spectroscopy happened in 1869, so just 10 years after the invention of the spectroscope. There was a total solar eclipse that two independent scientists, Young and Harkness, both used spectroscopes to observe. And during that total solar eclipse, both Young and Harkness independently observed a type of light that had never been observed on the Earth before. This spectral line appeared in the green part of the spectrum. And scientists had no idea what generated this line. They had never observed anything at this particular wavelength before. And therefore, they made the presumption that this was an element that only existed in the sun's corona. And therefore, they called it coronium. So the presumption was that we had a, an element that had never been observed on Earth. Therefore, it didn't exist on Earth. And therefore, it was an element found in the sun only. Actually, in the sun's corona specifically. It wasn't until more than 60 years later, in the 1930s, that a Swedish scientist named Edelin proposed that this wasn't in fact a brand new element, but that it was a very, very highly ionized form of iron. In fact, he proposed that of iron's 26 electrons, that 13 of them had been removed in order to produce emission at this particular wavelength. Now, initially, this seemed like a very far-fetched idea. In order to remove 13 electrons from iron, that requires a huge amount of energy. So when we talk about energy, we can talk similarly about temperature. If you have a lot of energy, you can calculate what the temperature must be at, the same, at, at that location. In order to produce iron with 13 of its electrons missing, we call that iron-14 in astronomy, that requires temperatures of more than 1 million degrees Kelvin. Now, one of the main reasons that scientists were skeptical about this is that the sun's surface is only five to 6,000 degrees Kelvin. And now we're talking about the upper layers of the atmosphere being at more than a million degrees Kelvin. So where's all of that energy coming from? And you know, that's something that we still don't have a solid answer for. Although scientists continue to investigate and produce theories, there is no widely accepted answer to why the sun's corona is more than a million degrees temperature. Although we have confirmed 
that what was once considered coronium is actually highly ionized iron. We don't know where, how the temperature in the corona is getting to be so high. And this is the solar coronal heating problem. And it's one of the great unanswered questions in solar physics. So this just goes to show that even 150 years later, observations that started with a solar eclipse still have no answer. This year the eclipse is particularly important because normally when we have a solar eclipse we get about two minutes of totality. However, we're able to track this eclipse across the entire country and that means that we can get almost 90 minutes of solar totality. Who knows what kind of questions our observations in August of this year will produce, hopefully pushing the field of solar physics further into the future the same way as the 1869 solar eclipse did. So now that we've talked about some ancient observations of the solar corona, how do we go about observing the solar eclipse ourselves? So it's very important to make sure that you have adequate eye protection for the solar eclipse. And this is especially true if you are not on the path of totality. So if you are not on the path of totality, you will require eye protection throughout the entire duration of the eclipse. So that means that anytime you want to observe what's happening with the eclipse, whether by looking directly at the sun or indirectly at some projection of the sun, you must use adequate eye protection. If you're lucky enough to be on the path of totality, you're still going to need eye protection in the run up to the period of totality and afterwards. So during those partial phases, you're going to need to protect your eyes as well. Adequate eye protection in this case means solar eclipse glasses. They tend to be the best and the easiest to use. Alternatives include pinhole projectors or pinhole cameras, uh, projection using binoculars or telescopes, and welder's glasses are another alternative. Whatever you use, you need to make sure that it is still in good working order. So when you put on your solar eclipse glasses, the film should be completely black. You should not get any light through the eclipse glasses until you go outside and you look at the sun with the eclipse glasses on. And all you should see is a very faint disk of the, sol of the sun. You shouldn't see a bright sun, you shouldn't see anything very powerful. The idea with the eclipse glasses is they're very strong filters that remove all of the light other than a very small amount of light that's coming from the sun itself. So a good rule of thumb is anytime there is any little bit of the sun surface on show, you need to make sure that you have your eyes protected. Eclipse glasses are the easiest and the probably the most versatile ways that we can protect our eyes. But not everybody will have access to eclipse glasses on the day of the eclipse. So today we're going to look at making a very, very simple and hopefully inexpensive uh, pinhole viewer. And this is something that you don't use to look directly at the sun. You allow the sun's rays to pass through a very tiny hole and project that view of the sun onto a piece of card or onto the ground. And then you're able to track the progress of the eclipse uh, over time. As the moon moves in front of the sun and the sun looks starts to look like a crescent, we'll see the crescent projected on the ground or on your piece of card through our pinhole viewer. Okay, let's get started. So in order to do this activity, you need some very basic materials. We're going to need a piece of card, some tape, a scissors, some aluminum foil, and a drawing pin. To begin, you can either use your card as a full-size piece of card, or you can trim it down to a, a smaller piece. The larger it is, the better projection you'll get because you won't get stray light from uh, coming in around the edges. I'm going to trim this piece of card in half for now. Um, and we're going to begin by cutting a roughly one inch square out of the center of the card. It doesn't have to be exact, we're going to cover it up. So once you've finished cutting out your square, we're going to take a piece of aluminum foil that's ever so slightly larger than this square and we're going to tape it down on one side of the card. Try to keep your aluminum foil nice and taut, nice and, uh, nice and flat, and that will allow the light to pass through as cleanly as possible. Once you have your aluminum foil taped down, we're going to take a basic drawing pin, and we're just going to poke a very small hole in the center of our aluminum foil. We use aluminum foil because this gives us nice sharp edges, which allows the projection to be nice and clean. Like I said, it's very important that you don't use this to look directly at the sun. You use your pinhole viewer 
to allow the light from the sun to pass through it and it, sh it shines on a piece of card or on some other surface that you can then look at indirectly. So do not use this to look directly at the sun. You can also use pretty much anything that has a, a pretty small hole in it. So you can use a vegetable strainer or a colander and can allow the light to pass through that. You can intertwine your fingers and allow the light to pass through your fingers and project onto the ground. And you should be able to pick up the crescent of the, of the sun as the eclipse occurs. You can get creative. You can poke multiple holes in your aluminum foil and you can create patterns. So as the solar eclipse progresses and the full disk of the sun becomes a crescent, you can see this changing in the pattern that you might create. You can do this using leaves on a tree. If you look at the shadows of trees on the ground, you should be able to see the crescent of the eclipse once the moon has started to move in front of the sun. So it's a great way to get creative. So now that we've made our own observing tools, it's time to turn it over to one of the world's leading eclipse scientists to hear how she got into this field and how she goes about creating the beautiful images of the solar eclipse. Dr. Shadia Habal is joining us all the way from Hawaii today. So we do apologize that there may be some technical difficulties with this section of the broadcast, but hopefully you'll still be able to hear her very important message and very interesting science. Okay, thank you, Shadia. Over to you. Good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Shadia Habal, and I'm professor of, uh, 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 of astronomy at the University of Hawaii, the Institute for Astronomy. Uh, what I'd like to talk to you today is uh, how I got into eclipses and uh, eclipse observations, and also uh, the unique science that we can get out of eclipses and their value. So uh, what, the way I started is, it was around 1993 or 4, I was doing um, modeling of the solar wind. And then we always had uh, this, uh, uh, this one parameter that we needed to know, which was the electron temperature. Uh, so I came across, uh, I was very much aware of eclipse observations, but I hadn't uh, uh, appreciated how important they were for uh, getting uh, uh, the physical parameters of the corona. Uh, so I, uh, I decided that maybe we should try uh, an eclipse observation. And at the time, uh, digital cameras had just started to uh, come on the market. And we, I figured uh, these were easy to take to eclipses. So we, we, I submitted a proposal to NASA and we got started this way. So we went to, Ch uh, to India in 1995 and that was my first eclipse, and it was 42 seconds long. Nevertheless, it was one of the most beautiful ones, and we got some nice data. Um, so uh, observing during eclipses becomes an addiction when you realize that you can do better, you can improve on your instrumentation, and you can get some really uh, very important information. So... Um, it was in 2006 that uh, in Libya that we discovered uh, uh, we got the first image of the corona in a color which is uh, which corresponds to iron that has been uh, uh, had lost uh, 10 of its electrons and the image was quite surprising and so what i'd like to describe today is uh, what i call the co the colors of the corona because during uh, just going back to uh, when people, before photography, people would draw the details they saw in images, and these details were uh, exquisite. Um, but when, uh, at the, with the advent of photography, you could, one could tell that the images were, okay, they were, uh, they were captured, but they didn't, they were missing the fine details that one could uh, see with the eye. Nevertheless, we proceeded, and uh, the um, the one one fact I need to to bring out is that after photography, um, there was also the discovery of the spectrometer, and uh, it was during the eclipse of uh, of eighteen sixty nine that um, people discovered one spectral line, uh, a color green, that they didn't know what it corresponded to. And it wasn't until 70 years later that it, in, uh, in, from theoretical calculations and laboratory experiments that Grotrian and Adlen uh, realized that this was iron that had lost 13 of its electrons, meaning 
that uh, the corona or the medium where it was uh, coming from was at least at a million degrees. So the implications were significant. And I think this is the start of our space exploration because one, it meant uh, this very hot corona meant that it could not remain bound to the sun. Therefore, there was a stream of particles that uh, Parker uh, called the solar wind. In addition, at this temperature, uh, this temperature implied that the corona could emit in the extreme ultraviolet and X-rays, and that it could be actually observed from space. And this was the launch of the space uh, age. Uh, so, but the most important for us uh, is really the fact that uh, the solar wind, which is the stream of particles from the sun out into space, uh, is the cause of the aurora, and it's also the cause of uh, the uh, some of the beautiful iron uh, tails of comets. Now, it's, uh, one would wonders why in this uh, age of space exploration, why is it that we still uh, want to use eclipses to observe the sun? Well, it's um, when, uh, by looking at images, for example, in the extreme ultraviolet, where one can see uh, the, the disk of the sun or the surface directly looking down at the sun, and also uh, some of uh, the extension of the emission of the edge, one realizes that this emission cuts off very quickly. And compared to an eclipse image, you can see much further away from the sun from the eclipse. Now, uh, Liu had, in the 1930s, had invented a coronagraph, which was a man-made occulter, which mimicked the effect of an eclipse. And uh, so it blocked the disk of the sun, and one could see the corona. So with a man-made uh, coronagraph, you can uh, see, uh, you can block the disk of the sun and you can uh, see the corona, except that its extent uh, is not as far out as what you see during a total solar eclipse. And the other uh, limitation is the fact that this man-made disk uh, covers a little bit more than just past uh, the perimeter of the sun. Um, now, from space, uh, the coronagraphs, the one that's been operating since 95, LASCO C2, uh, it's been extremely valuable for uh, giving data, you know, continuously over time. So we see all the dynamic events, events in the corona. But what's happening is a, a significant part of the corona starting from the solar surface out to a few, uh, out to a radius above the surface is all missing. And this is where uh, the eclipse observations come in. Now, uh, the, um, I mentioned earlier that with the advent of photography, uh, the, what was uh, kind of disappointing is that you capture an image of the, of the sun within total solar eclipse, except you really don't capture all the fine details on camera that you get with your eye. And this is where uh, people started to work on develop developing image processing techniques. And one of the most remarkable techniques were, were developed by uh, Professor Druckmüller, who's in uh, University of uh, Brno University in the Czech Republic. So uh, with this, um, with the pro image processing, then you can retrieve uh, all the details you see in uh, the eclipse images. And uh, when we compare these images with what uh, one gets from space, for example, from the extreme ultraviolet, then uh, the match is uh, actually astounding. And we have an example from the eclipse of 2015, where it was at the beginning of the launch of uh, STO, and we could compare um, the, uh, the uh, image, the extreme ultraviolet image, and match it to the uh, coronal image from the eclipse. And the extent uh, showed where, how things at the sun started and how they expanded into interplanetary space or much further away from the sun. So uh, I, I want to go back now to the question of what kind of science we're doing. And I mentioned that we're trying to capture uh, the uh, colors of the corona. Now, if you recall, we talked about uh, the importance of the discovery of the green line. And uh, it turns out that uh, in addition to protons and electrons that are the most uh, dominant particles in the corona. You also have trace elements from the most abundant is iron, but you have oxygen, nickel, 
uh, argon, uh, you name it. Um, there, there are plenty, all the elements are there in the corona. And they produce, uh, each one of them has a specific color or wavelength or frequency at which it likes to emit. So what we try to do is to probe deeper into the physics of the corona, is to try to capture these different colors or uh, that these different elements are emitting. So what we've done so far is try to focus on the iron uh, spectral uh, iron element because it produces different spectral lines or different colors. So from these colors, we were able to uh, discover uh, that. Um, the, uh, uh, the corona is dominated by the emission that corresponds to two different temperatures. One is around a million degrees and the other is around two million degrees. And uh, this, uh, everything that streams away from the sun seems to be at the cooler temperature. So in a way, it's, uh, it's giving us an answer to what I had originally started to look for, which is the electron temperature. However, what we noticed is that uh, when we take eclipse observations as a function of time, we see that uh, the distribution of these colors or this emission changes uh, because the corona changes as a function of time. The other important thing that we uh, discovered is uh, that uh, with, uh, for example, uh, not only can we uh, look at uh, the distribution of the emission, but we can also tell something about whether these uh, ions or these particles, uh, how, uh, if they're moving in the corona, how fast they're moving. And in 2015, it was the first time that we captured a whole uh, coronal mass ejection front uh, with different bits of it traveling away from the observer at speeds ranging from 100 to 1500 kilometers per second. What was even more exciting was that some of these bits had with them, uh, these very, very hot bits of 2 million degrees, uh, had with them very, very cool material, which is characteristic of prominences. And prominences are these cool features, cool in temperature, and are usually uh, bound to the sun, but when they erupt, they, they form, uh, they produce, or they trigger these coronal mass ejections. So what we found is that uh, we just captured in the image uh, the bits of these uh, very dense and cool uh, material embedded within this uh, huge and very, very hot uh, temperature uh, front. So uh, the, the equipment we use to, uh, to gather these observations are rather simple. They're, um, they're cameras um, uh, and, and we have... Uh, cameras which are retrofitted with special filters to isolate the emission from uh, the different iron lines or anything else. And uh, also we have a spectrometer. Now, because we go to different places around the world, uh, we try to keep the equipment uh, light enough or compact enough so that we can easily transport it. And most of the optics we carry with us on the plane in backpacks. So. Uh, the uh, now with this upcoming eclipse in uh, August of this year, there's a an incredible opportunity to have different observing sites along the path of totality, and uh, this would give us uh, more chances to beat weather uh, to to guarantee that we get data, because these observations can only be made a, maybe every once a year or every once every eighteen months. And because they're so unique, we want to capitalize on every single opportunity we can to get these observations. So uh, the, the best sites are towards the western part of the United States. And uh, so this is where we will be going. And I hope that uh, as many people as possible, uh, regardless whether they're scientists or just any person, will try to get to the center line to observe this gorgeous phenomenon. Thanks, Shadia. And hopefully you have a great observing session during the eclipse this year. So that's it for this month. We hope that you found this useful. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them below. If you have anything specific that you'd like us to cover in one of our webcasts, please get in touch with us. You can email us directly at outreach at nso.edu. 
You can post your suggestions below the videos. You can get us on Twitter at NatSolarObs or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash National Solar Observatory. And we have a new Instagram account and our Instagram handle is at National Solar Observatory. So please get in touch, let us know what you think of the videos, if you have any questions, if you'd like us to cover anything specific. And we hope that you'll join us next month.